So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Caroline Cherick. I'm the Textile Society of America's Executive Director. Um, first off, I want to say thank you all for joining us today for Sanford Biggers talking about code switch. Um, to those of you who were here for the symposium, um, welcome back. We're so glad that we could do this now and that you're rejoining us. Um, and I know we have some people who um, are joining us for the first time uh, who didn't attend the symposium. To, so to all of you, welcome. Um, and I'll also just talk a little bit about TSA. Um, so the Textile Society of America provides an international forum for the exchange and dissemination of information about textiles worldwide from artistic, cultural, economic, historical, political, social, and technical perspectives. Um, we're a membership organization. Um, I invite you to check out our website and you know, if you enjoy this program, become a member or consider making a donation. We're in our year end campaign part of the year right now. Um, before we get started, I just want to orient you to the, the Zoom platform that we're using right now. Um, so Sanford's gonna speak for 40 minutes and then we're gonna have 20 minutes for Q and A. Um, if you wanna submit a question, we're gonna do that via text. So there's a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q and A. Um, feel free to type those in throughout the presentation if something comes to mind, and then we'll um, use the time that we have to go through those at the end. Um, I'm also, we also have the chat function, and I'm not going to really be monitoring that, but right now I do want to direct you to um, the virtual walkthrough of the exhibition that's at the Bronx Museum today. Um, Sanford's gonna be kind of stationary while he speaks, but you can use that to view the gallery on your own. It's, it's really cool. There's like, it's very good quality images and you can see kind of spatially how everything is. Um, so I just put that link in the chat. If you wanna kind of have that going in a separate window um, you know, to kind of explore as he speaks, that's a thing that you could try today um, or you can save it for later. And um, you know, I think it's gonna be online for a while. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Kreiner, TSA's board president. Um, hello and welcome, everybody. I'm Lisa Kreiner, Textile Society of America's president, and I'm happy so many of you could join us today for this special event. It's a great pleasure and a distinct honor to be able to introduce today's speaker, Sanford Biggers. Sanford Biggers is an artist exploring the interplay of narrative, perspective, and history that speaks to current social, political, and economic happenings, while also examining the contexts that bear them. Sanford is the recipient of numerous awards, including a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in 2020. He was inducted into the New York Foundation for the Arts Hall of Fame in 2019, and he received the Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in 2018. Um, and in 2017, he was presented with the 2017 Rome Prize in the Visual Arts. Today, he will be talking about his exhibition, Code Switch, at the Bronx Museum of Art, and the exhibition will be on view um, until January of 2021. You can also find uh, Sanford's full bio on the TSA website. Thank you to everyone who made this talk possible, and special thanks to the Lenore G. Tawney Foundation for its continued support of Textile Society of America's keynote speakers. And thank you much, Sanford, for taking your time out of a busy schedule, I'm sure, to join us today and share your artwork with us. My pleasure. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, just to give you a little background, uh, I am now presently sitting in the middle of one of the galleries of the exhibition Code Switch. And I'd like to give a shout out and a Great thank you to TSA for even having me and inviting me to be the keynote speaker for this year. And thank you for your patience as I had to postpone the last one due to some uh, family issues. And I also wanna thank the curators of the show at the Bronx Museum, um, Sergio Besa and Andrea Anderson. And um, I guess we should probably begin with a little bit about myself. Um, Sam for Biggers. I was born in Los Angeles and I've been a practicing professor and artist in New York City uh, for almost around 20, maybe a little more than 20 years now. And uh, I consider myself a conceptual artist. Um, I began making work many, you know, a few decades ago, but uh, the work we're going to speak about today, the Code Switch exhibition, is a series of paintings, drawings, collage, assemblage, 
that I've been doing on found and antique quilts for a little over a decade now. Um, and I bring in that up to say because I um, have the utmost deference for a lot of you uh, fabricators, makers, and producers who are tuning in right now. I personally am not a quilter by trade, but I am a conceptual artist and I have been using the history, um, the significance, um, the juxtaposition of quilting within the contemporary art world and aspects of that as part of this ongoing Codex series. And I call the series the Codex series because as I've intimated, um, being a conceptual artist, I work in many different forms, sometimes in bronze sculptures, sometimes in marble, sometimes in sand, frequently in video and performance. And I look at this series of um, paintings, the Codex series, as an almanac or almost a guide to understanding those other aspects of my, um, my career. And it's worth mentioning uh, that this show uh, contains more than 60 pieces. And that is not even, that's probably just about half of the entirety of the Codex series. So this exhibition is a monographic exhibition dedicated strictly to that series. It is not a retrospective. This is one series of work among several other series of work that have their own monographic curation as well. So um, this is really sort of a big picture um, conversation that this body of work that we're gonna talk about today falls within an even larger body of work. Um, I believe that's important because this is about history. This is about the retelling and rewriting of history, which is something that I think is extremely important. I think that quilts are extremely, um, what's a good word? Uh, this is one of the strengths of quilts. It tells histories. It tells histories visually. It tells histories even in the formation and the making of it. The hands that have been on it, the bodies that have been within it, uh, the materials used, where those materials were salvaged from, um, even literally the history and legacy of the thread and the fabrics themselves, which unfortunately I do not know all of that information with every single one. And that is something that I actually am later on going to ask of you, the audience, if people out there do have some of that kind of knowledge that we can have a conversation, a sidebar conversation. Um, because as I'm getting to this idea of history um, is very important to me in my practice. I consider history itself to be a material and I believe it's a malleable material as well. We sculpt history. We're in a current moment where we're watching things that we believe to be established fact and quote unquote truths and history being changed or discounted or challenged right in front of our very eyes. Um, I think art has a way of commenting and critiquing that process and acknowledging its presence, but also challenge, challenging its veracity. Um, I think it's very interesting to use quilts to do that kind of work because um, in larger American culture for many, many decades, quilts were considered to be or almost ghettoized for lack of a better term and considered to be craft versus quote unquote high art and all those other dichotomies that come up that ultimately ghettoize not only quilting but work made by certain individuals and that are usually shown, shown in certain contexts that are not um, necessarily vaunted by the higher art establishment. Anyway, maybe we should start by talking about some pieces. Um, Let's see, I want to try to go to the very beginning of this series. And if you'll do a walk with me, I know some of you are on the virtual um, exhibition. So uh, you can use that to get to some of these objects or you can follow us as uh, we do our very lo-fi walkthrough. <laughs> Um, so um, right in this room, I'm gonna show you two pieces that I consider to be really the birth of this, um, this body of work. And the first one, you probably hear some of the ambient sound. It was actually not a quilt or a cloth or a textile based piece at all, but literally it was a dance floor. So um, within the nineties, I lived in Nagoya, Japan for around three years. And during that time, I got very, very interested in Buddhism. And I studied with a few monks while I was there. I later went back to Japan and did a large project there. I also spent a lot of time in the kimono shops. 
and in the temples and the shrines and so on, and later started to interject aspects of that experience into my work. So when I arrived in New York, uh, a little bit prior to moving to New York, I had left Japan, I'd come back to the United States, and I was now in grad school in Chicago at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I started a series of works where I was making hand cut linoleum mandalas that I would place on the floor. And I would then take those dance floors to various break dancing competitions throughout New York City, typically. And this particular one that we're gonna show is called the Mandala of the Bee Bodhisattva. And it was a collaborative project. Um, I worked with uh, David Ellis to uh, make this piece and basically take it to the Bronx Community College, which is very close to where we're standing right now. And it was part of a breakdance competition. And one of the aspects that I didn't mention, hopefully you can, there we go, is that once the dance floor was installed, and this dance floor was around 16 feet by 16 feet. We then mounted a video camera directly above to get a bird's eye perspective of that dance floor. And then throughout the competition, we filmed the various break dancers doing their motions, doing their gestures, doing their battle, which is also circular based on top of this mandala. So in some respects, this is basically their, their bodies are mirroring the mandala's uh, gestures. And this came about because uh, in some of my research and studying um, in Japan, there was a passage that I was fascinated by that said that monks sometimes never, they didn't have to depict a mandala. They could actually dance the mandala. They remembered the circles, they remembered the composition, and they would do certain movements and dancing and walking that mimic the mandala itself. And this is something that permeates uh, sort of Buddhist um, thinking in many ways, because meditation is a large part, but there's many types of meditation seated meditation, walking meditation, eating meditation. And this is also one form of a meditation. So maybe we can get, I don't know how much I can hear, but if you can see your turn. And this was also influenced by, um, many of you may be familiar with Busby Berkeley and some of the incredible musical and choreograph uh, composition, dancing compositions that were shot with a bird's eye view camera um, back in the early days of cinema. And that piece that we just saw, the, uh, the mandala was first exhibited literally here at the Bronx Museum in a show called One Planet Under a Group that was curated by Lydia Yi and Franklin Sermons. I think this was around 2002 or 2003. So in some ways it's a homecoming for this to be here. Um, we did not include the, the physical dance floor this time, just the video documentation of it. But this pattern-based work literally was the work that started my interest in pattern and sacred geometry that later was sort of reinvigorated when I started to learn more about quilts and wanting to play with the pattern and the geometry that's inherent in many quilt designs. And what we have behind us is literally the second quilt um, that I worked on. And this one is called uh, US UGRR number two, Underground Railroad number two. And that title comes from research um, that I started in around 2006 or 2007 when I was invited to do a project in Philadelphia. And that project was called Hidden Cities. And a few artists were asked to reimagine um, important structures, architecture, and buildings in Philadelphia that had gone into disrepair and out of the collective memory of the, of the city itself. And we were supposed to sort of resuscitate them with art installations and interventions. And uh, the place I decided to do, uh, as, use as the headquarters of my project was the Mother Bethel Church located in central um, Philly. And that particular, I'm sorry, downtown Philly. And that particular church is one of the oldest black owned pieces of real estate in the, in the US, at least documented. And it also was a place that was a hub for the Underground Railroad. So as enslaved people were escaping from the South and making their way up North, this was one of the places where they could find safe harbor. And throughout the city itself were many different documented locations that were called stations of the Underground Railroad where there were abolitionists and friends and um, supporters of the cause. 
So this particular one, um, oh, an, another very important aspect of that uh, research was um, upon looking at um, an, another exhibition that was at Temple at the time, a small exhibition of quilts, there is an ongoing anecdote that quilts were used on the Underground Railroad as signposts. So certain patterns were depicted or quilts were folded in different ways and, uh, and displayed outside of safe houses and escaping um, slaves were able to read that and decipher that to figure out either ways to move forward, how to navigate through the South and make their way up North or just basic information like whether the safe house was under surveillance or not. And that really sparked the, um, this, this body of work because I thought about code being embedded in quilts and what would it mean for somebody 100 years, 150 years removed from that experience to then interject or intervene with new layers of code already on existing code. And of course, I'm thinking of cyber technologies as well and coding in much larger form, but I saw the potential for the quilts to then become a palimpsest or sort of a, um, a temporal document that is talking about American history through different generations, through different centuries even, through material and mark making. And on this particular one, some of that imagery goes down to ge geometric shapes and platonic solids. Um, and right here, it's very hard for, probably for you to pick it up on the screen. Just like that. There you go. Um, there's footprints right here. And these were a way of me depicting uh, footprints that might have been seen as um, enslaved people are making their journey towards the north. And in this process, I already I also started thinking of Harriet Tubman as an astronaut um, with the ability to read the stars and navigate, circumnavigate um, the south via the stars and the moons and all those signs. Um, and then I developed my own symbology that I started to interject on these as well. And that is encapsulated right there in that top diagram, which I call Lotus. This is also influenced from Buddhist, um, <clears throat> my studies in Buddhism as well, is that the Lotus Blossom um, is this transformative uh, symbol of purity, um, calmness, wholeness, and so on. But if you get really close to this particular lotus, you realize that each of those, each of those petals on this lotus are actually slave ships. And this is a fa famous diagram of the ship Brooks. Um, and this was a diagram made by a slaver to show how to best pack human cargo um, when taking bodies, basically, Africans from various ports um, um, in Africa to bring them to uh, South America and the U.S. and other ports, um, the Caribbean and so on. And this lotus uh, diagram is also a sculpture of mine. Um, if any of you want to do any further research into my work, you can look at my website or just look up Sanford Biggers and Lotus. And this is derived from a much larger glass sculpture. It's around a seven and a half foot diameter glass sculpture that has an etched version of this image in it. And when you're on the uh, virtual walkthrough, there is an option that if you click on those lotus images throughout the website, it will take you to other portals and other projects that I've done that are related to the larger practice. Okay, why don't we move over? This piece is called Vex. And you notice that there's also a lotus blossom in the upper uh, left corner of this one. And there are these, I, I, a lot of the imagery in these is reoccurring. The imagery on this one is um, a tree. And the tree and plants and um, bonsai and blossoming flowers is a reoccurring motif in this work. Um, I think it was largely influenced by my time in Japan and uh, the proximity I had to um, kibono shops and seeing all the, uh, the beautiful graphics that were on those. Um, also refers to another large installation of mine called Blossom, which is um, basically a full-size replication replica of a tree with a piano. So the tree is basically growing through the piano and upending the piano. And when you walk into the room, the piano starts to play music and it plays my version of um, Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday and Abe Mirapool. So when you see some of that imagery in these, it's usually a reference to either the kimono 
or um, floral, floral blossoms or that particular piece blossom. And this one I wanted to show you because in particular, there is another layer of color. Within one of the leaves is actually a QR code. And this piece was done in 2014. And um, I started experimenting with QR codes um, <laughs> in the first generation of QR codes. And by the time I made this piece, QR codes have been totally out of fashion. And now they've come back again because of where we are technologically, but also where we are in terms of the pandemic and the need for uh, no contact um, access to different portals, <clears throat> which I find extremely relevant because I consider that Lotus image imagery and even some of the quotes themselves to literally be portals. These are ways of looking back into history or looking forward and trying to understand our future by understanding that path. That path. So um, you'll have access to that on the virtual walkthrough as well. Um, but it's also, um, there's a music video that also has quilt imagery and it's an original score that's done by myself and my um, uh, music ensemble called Move Medicine. And there is an example of that work in this show. There's a little video um, in the very front room that shows that piece as well. So um, maybe we should just do a little walk around for those who aren't on the virtual so they can get an idea of the scale of things in here. There. So we're just gonna walk down one of the hallways and you'll get an idea of some of the scale here. So this is a more recent piece. This is called The Tyranny of Mirrors. Let me see if I can change your perspective. It's hard to catch all the imagery on there and there's some very subtle uses of metallic paints that pop in certain angles and don't pop in other angles. Um, and I show this just to show an example of, um, in comparison to the others that you've seen, that there are reoccurring motifs and then changing motifs, reoccurring um, processes and then new processes that get in, introduced as I've been doing these over the last um, decade and a half, decade or so. So in this particular one, you see the really, the expansion of geometric perspective, which has always been something that I've been interested in in relationship to quilts. Um, when I look at many of them, I personally already start to see three-dimensional and spatial illusion happening in them. And sometimes I don't see that at all. Sometimes they're totally flat and just flat based geometric pattern. And one of the challenges I see in working with this material is finding a way sometimes to just add in a couple of angles or lines that can uh, sort of exploit that potential for perspective, for perspective and illusion. And this is particularly one of those where this geometric pattern starts to get that concentric of squares start to create this um, sort of time warp portal effect. Once again, talking about portal and transportation. Um, that that sort of happens with this one. And, you know, unfortunately, if you don't have a chance to see the show in person, you'll miss certain subtleties. Like there's things that happen even when you get very close to the paint and you start to lose the color of the graphics, but you start to see the texture of the shapes of the thread work. And the thread, in my opinion, starts to become like drawing marks and different line pitch and these are the parts of the quilt that I think probably excite me the most is when you get these extreme close-ups and interesting things start to pop up. Um, I think there's another around here that does some of this. Oh yeah, this would be. Like some of the uh, intricate graphic work on this. And the imagery is derived from many, many different places, sometimes comic books, sometimes uh, architectural drawings. In this particular one, this may have come from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. 
There's a lot of references to mandalas, of course, and tonkas and graffiti. Um, growing up in Los Angeles, I was a graffiti artist. So some of these illusionistic three-dimensional effects come from that, which is also related to graphic novels and comic books. And then another aspect of these are the titles themselves. And this particular one is called Zora, and it's after Zora Neale Hurston. Um, but then there's other titles like uh, here. If I remember correctly, it's called Buddha Bless. And once again, riffing off of ideas that I've seen in mandalas and um, Tibetan diagrams, this actually is a monk floating here sort of headlessly. Um, and that's also borrowing some Af um, <clears throat> aspects from African shrines, various shrines in different countries in Africa of the most important objects actually being cloaked and you're not able to see any of the detail. So instead of depicting an actual monk, it's just the robes. And that also alludes back to the fact that the textile itself is used for covering bodies. And I should also mention that to me, these aren't merely canvases. They're not two dimensional works. They're actually sculptural and performative. So they really transcend a lot of different um, formats, in my opinion. Uh, there's always the imprint and the patina of the hands that made them and the bodies that they once covered or comforted. And I think that's important because I'm actually responding to that when I work on these. I don't really have a sketchbook of imagery and then I go to these and I'm like, I'm just gonna impose it on this. I actually work directly with each one and try to figure out what's the best way to approach it what's already there that I can work with and what can I add to either accentuate something or you know, create more tension and pushes and pull. Um, and that's actually interesting too. Tension is a big thing with these. I think there's a lot of tension formally with these, but I also think the process and conceptually these have a lot of tension. There's the tension and the, um, uh, let's see. Uh, the notion that most of these more than likely were made by either singular women or groups of women. However, there are probably groups of men and men who worked on many of these too. I don't have the history of all of them. And the way that I receive some of these quilts, there's no history to be had, at least for me. It might've been a vernacular family history that was never given to me. So in some ways, I'm assuming the history is there and that I'm being a custodian in a way of perpetuating that history, very much like if you think of uh, musical sampling. If there's a song that was a huge hit, like say in the 60s or 70s, and you haven't heard it for 30 or 40 years, and then was reintroduced to you in contemporary music, and then you have your kids telling you about the song that you already know about. In some ways that's a bit of a, res a resurrection. And I think there's a resurrection um, aspect to these in terms of that material. But that tension that I was alluding to is the notion of me um, as a man coming in and working on these. I grapple with that all the time. Is this defacement? Is this um, embellishment? Is this vandalism or is this collaboration? Um, and that's sort of, you know, I like that tension. I think it's important because I think there's a lot of power in these objects. These are also power objects. Um, and I think there's a soft power behind these, which is very important. And I noticed that when I went to the G's Bin quilt show at the Whitney Museum. And I saw those incredible quilts in the bastion of, you know, abstract contemporary American male driven art. And there was a social and political juxtaposition, but there was the formal juxtaposition. And the quilts clearly held their own and actually got me interested again in working <laughs> in two dimensions. Um, so there, there's lots of tensions there. Uh, and, but there's also the physical aspect of these. You know, as any of you who work with this material know, it's tough material, it can handle a lot. And when I first started working with them, I was, you know, very, uh, let's say, I treated them as if they were fragile and delicate and tried to leave, trying to leave everything intact because I, you know, didn't want to quote unquote destroy them. And then a couple of them kicked me back. <laughs> they kicked me back in the head and say, wait, wait, why are you, you know, Go ahead and do it. You got to, you know, you got to move this around. You got to pull this, you got to stretch this. You got to play with this. It's material after all. And I come from a background of working with wood and metal before working with this. So that durability yet flexibility to me ended up being more powerful and more poignant 
then working with wood and metal. So in some ways I do consider this to be very sculptural. And when I say performative, it's because these performed, they were worn. Somebody had it draped over their body while they're walking through the hallway. Somebody slept on it. They're performative acts. Who knows what else could have been happening in the beds these might have covered. There was performative acts, let's just say. And that these end up being, that's part of the, the palimpsestual in information that's embedded in these. And that's part of the material base that I think I'm working with when I do my interventions on top of all that. It never excludes those things. It's actually trying to find a way of incorporating or um, letting that live through it as well. I think we'll go through these two. This one is called um, Harlem Blue. And let's try to get this one. And I was talking about those sort of um, moments that I find magical that are in the details of these. And that's the moments when you start to see the layering of paint. And that's when I really start to see um, personally for me, being influenced by works by, let's say, Renoir and Hiroshige and all those different painting histories and the mark making histories as well. Um, Reoccurring symbols, we did some piano on a few of these. We've seen musical references either in the graphic work or in the titles themselves. Um, there's a very large blossomy, blossomy tree right here. And once again, those details. Oh, don't touch the art, I'm sorry. Um, there are certain decisions that happen. Um, I wouldn't say they're ne necessarily um, you know, pre-decided by myself. I think it's just a reaction to the fabric or sometimes feeling that it's not necessary to complete the imagery because the imagery is already sort of baked in. And it's about knowing when to stop and pull back and letting our optical or retinal um, intelligence fill in the blanks. I think that's actually something that quilts inherently do on their own, which is another thing that I find fascinating about them is especially that use of pattern and complex pattern that makes the eye sort of um, vibrate. There's a retinal vibration that happens. And for me personally, this may happen for others as well as when you squint, you start to see other things happening and pull out of those, uh, those patterns. And I think in this first room, there's a lot of pieces that are doing exactly what the show is about, code switching. And the term code switching, many of you already know as a linguistic phrase saying, uh, that really talks about how people change different communication techniques and tactics when dealing with different situations or different audiences. But there's also the social ramification of that, which I think really applies to um, disenfranchised people all around the world. But um, in the US perspective, I'm thinking um, black and brown and women who have to change codes of communication, dress, gesture, um, position, whatever it may be, to navigate and matriculate through society effectively. Um, it's an unfortunate fact, but it is a fact nonetheless. Um, and it's a defense mechanism uh, or survival tactic, better. It's not a defense mechanism, it's more of a survival tactic. And in this, you know, room, I think you're starting to see some of that imagery that starts to touch on some political things as well, because that is definitely embedded in this work. I'm purposefully not talking about that in detail right now, because I really like people to form their own opinions about that as they see the work. But there's also how some of these works mimic other references. Um, I mentioned that I lived in Japan, and I love what they call boro, um, boro, boro um, quilting there, which are actually futon covers that were made out of in, you know dyed indigo pieces of fabric and it has a very particular aesthetic. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. 
But then the backing and the lining of some American quilts actually have a very similar thing happening. So I like the fact that this one is code switching between being a Japanese material, but it's actually an American material. Um, and then the figure, let's get a far shot of that. Hello? Hi, you're back. I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, phone, phone number one just died. So. Oh, got it. Okay. All right. Now, now it's me manually doing this. Okay. Um, and I know we only have a few more minutes, so I'm going to do a quick uh, browse through, through this room. But I just wanted to start with that and finish with this that we were talking about. And this one, code switching. What you're looking at is actually kimono fabric here. And then this is hand drawn um, with charcoal to create the trompe l'oeil effect of the shadow. And let's see, in this room, we have a few others that are using not only charcoal, but burnt cork. And, you know, I often say that there's um, a lot of meaning within the materials themselves. In this particular one, uh, those marks are made with burnt cork. And many of you know, in the history of blackface minstrelsy, which is literally the backbone of the American music industry. Um, many of the characters who had to blacken their face use burnt cork to do that. And this one right next to it is called The Talk. And it's the same thing happening. You have a solid um, striped fabric. And then this particular shadow is done with tar and glitter. And I'm really interested in, in the juxtaposition of materials, soft and hard materials, tar, glitter, um, the burnt cork, charcoal, spray paint, acrylic, and then any fabric I can get my hands on. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with, with what I'm alluding to with this piece. This is called the talk. And this is a reference that most um, African-Americans for sure uh, will understand because the talk is something that is basically like a coming of age conversation between parents and their children about how to deal with law enforcement, how to behave, how to code switch when being approached by the police. And it's the talk that's basically saying to them that you will not be treated like other people, that you are in danger and you will be perceived as a threat. So any move or any sound that you make will be used against you and you may be killed. It's an unfortunate reality, but this is exactly what the talk is. And it's, um, you know, maybe a, um, a glimpse of some of the non-reported communication that goes on with, uh, you know, communities of color just to survive. Um, we didn't get into that, uh, to these three dimensional pieces just yet, but I'm sure during the question and answer, we can address some of these. I mentioned that there, I've always had an interest in pushing the perspective and illusionist equality within the quilts. And the logical progression of that was starting to work with three-dimensional armatures. And to create um, anamorphic drawings and imagery and uh, parallax views and really complicate the geometry that is already inherent in these quilts and giving them a physical backbone that mirrors that same complexity. Uh, another very illusionistic piece right here, burnt cork on quilts. And the quilt itself is cut. So that I start in some of these later quilts dealing with negative space. And I think we're very close to the 40 minute mark and I wanna leave some time for question and answers. So um, I will defer to you all to figure out which, uh, what we should do next. Great, well, thank you, Sanford. That's um, it, it a really wonderful walkthrough. I'm excited to look at the 3D gallery more. Um, it's, it's great to hear just sort of the like web of, um, sort of references and associations of the materials and the patterns. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go into the questions. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Um, so there are several questions that came in about um, how you source the quilts. Um, and, and also if you can 
you know, I think you addressed some of this a little bit, but like, you know, sort of where they come from and then how you work with that, the anonymity of the, of the makers. Um, yeah, well, um, the quilts come from a variety of sources. Um, the very first quilts I worked on were borrowed. And the first few pieces I made were all temporary pieces. So everything I put on there were loosely sewn on or Velcroed on or safety pinned on because I knew I had to return the quilts. <laughs> so that's how they started. But um, the first major source for them was when I was doing a studio visit, I had a group of um, people in the studio. And as they were leaving, a woman stayed behind and uh, she had a lot of questions about the quilts. And then she finally said, listen, I used to um, collect and sell quilts and I have hundreds of them that are collecting dust, you know, for like the last seven or eight years in my closet and I don't know what to do with them. But I like what you're doing with these. Um, it's very complicated and it's uh, maybe even controversial to some. Um, and she's like, I have some, would you mind, uh, would you want some? And she donated like maybe 30 quilts to me. And that's when I really started to uh, sort of take off with this as a series. And from that initial grouping, I started to find more sources. Sometimes I show up at my studio and there's a box of quilts there. I had um, a couple of instances where I might've been doing a lecture somewhere and somebody stays afterwards and hands me a box or a bag full of quilt fragments or patches or samples. And they say things like, you know, my mom used to do this, she passed away, I've been holding on to this, I don't know what to do with it and I don't wanna throw them away. Would you, you know, do you wanna work with them? And I take all of that stuff because that's really, you know, part of the conceptual logic of this work is that these are patchworks. You know, I can't decide everything that's happening with all of them because I'm subject to what materials I even have available. And I like that. I like that as an obstruction to making these. And once again, to use a musical reference, it's very similar again to sampling or cutting and pasting um, in you know, editing software, taking what you have, cutting it, modifying it, putting it back, reusing it. Um, Lindsay Howell Franklin asks, uh, does the style of quilt impact your painting choice? For instance, your floating monk is on a wedding ring quilt. Did you do that intentionally or was that what you felt worked best with the quilt? I think she's talking about sort of the reference to the, like the meaning of the pattern. Sure, it, it really depends. Um, oh yeah, sorry. I love my, our human tripod has <laughs> come back in the room. <laughs> uh, yes, sometimes I play directly to um, a certain pattern and I try to compose with that as a theme. Um, and then sometimes I'm just reacting uh, sort of to the physical aspect or the visual aspect of a pattern and not necessarily the pattern's name and that pattern's history. So it's a mixed bag. And honestly, that's intentional and pragmatic on a few levels. Sometimes I just don't have a certain degree of provenance on some of these. Sometimes I'm dealing with just fragments. Sometimes I'm remixing the fragment fragments too. You know, I mean, there's a fractal logic happening here. And when you cut down a pattern, to its basic elements, you end up starting to deal with very basic geometry and platonic solids and so on, which relates to a much larger history of science and pseudoscience and blah, blah, blah. And I like playing with that aspect because I do feel that these have that same degree of comp um, complexity. Um, and working that with them on a granular level is actually very inspiring. Great. Um, here's one from Gabrielle Vale. She says, could you talk a little more about the concepts of codex and almanac in relation to your art? I'm a Mayanist who works with pre-Hispanic Mesoamerican codices and their associated almanacs, and I'm fascinated by the connections you're drawing to these types of media. So, um, as I mentioned, I lived in Japan for three years, um, but in addition to that, I've lived, you know, many, many other countries, you know, Brazil, Poland, uh, Hungary, Germany, on and on and on, um, traveled through several countries throughout um, Africa as well. And I find that there is a syncretism between not only just fabric work and patterns and so on, um, but also certain uh, almost archetypal um, human impulses. And so on that level, there are things that are common with Stonehenge as they might be with the Dogon and they might be with the Mayan and they might be with the uh, various other pre-Columbian cultures. Um, and my earlier work, if you check out my website and look at some of my earlier projects, you see that there's a very deep interest in ethnography and muse museological studies and how museums take objects out of context, put them in a new context and that whole conversation. 
So there's a bit of an, inst an institutional critique there in, in the earlier work, which is very uh, sort of tuned in to some of these problematics. Um, but the later work, I'm starting to literally com conflate it all together because I want you to be able to see that and say, there is an interesting relationship to the codices of mind, um, the mind studies that you're doing, yet somebody from another part of the world can find the same type of associations to where they're from. So that these literally become sort of um, very creolized. Um, you know, there is a combination of so all kinds of disparate elements that are now coming together to create a new whole that leaves a lot of valence and entry points for people from various cultures to find some type of uh, affinity towards. Okay, so like that was a long way of saying, yes, these are that, that interest in all my practice is about making objects that do have a complicated relationship with history and origin, and that there are various narratives that are implied in all that. And the quilts do that very singularly, like one by one. And other projects of mine, you might have to see the collective body to get to that idea of the research, but it's a consistent thread in everything that I do. There's a question. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, but someone was asking about. Um, I think you, when you were talking about the Underground Railroad and quilt symbolism um, as sort of connected as like a sort of like a meaning or language, um, they're asking what's the most up to date, um, like kind of where, where are we on the understanding of that mythology? The most recent um, that I read was around a year and a half ago and it was <laughs> sort of aggressively being de debunked. Um, I think I skipped Gates, to be honest with you. Um, and I might be a little fuzzy on that, so I don't want to misspeak, so apologies to Skip if I am. But I think that that was the case. Um, and this is just based off of, you know, I don't think it was personal interjection. This is just based off of uh, historical records and the ability to find certain type of proof and not find certain proof. But the thing that's important to me is that that story persists as a vernacular history and that um, people of color, especially uh, um, the African diaspora, we sort of rely on a griotic tradition of handing down information by the talk, conversations, verbal, performative, and artistic communication. So holding on to that as a history, even if it is just for the sake of vernacular culture, I think is still equally important. Um, the fact that we can speak together right now about the Underground Railroad, hip hop, break dancing, kimonos, and Mayan civilization in one conversation is sort of the goal that I'm trying to uh, get at with this work. Um, and do you use unembellished quilts in your own home, either before this project or now that you develop this series? And how do you feel about those ones versus the ones that you've intervened with artistically? That's a really good question. And it's funny, literally, I did not have a single quilt in my home until around seven years of working with this stuff. And um, I received a couple of quilts and I was like, this one is just so beautiful. I was like, why do I feel like I need to even do it? You know what, I'm just taking this home and that stays at the house. And I may use it at some point because, you know, I don't want to get too precious where, you know, now I have to hold this thing and it can't be used. But at the same time, I'm like, it's already doing so much work and I feel some type of affinity towards this one. So I'm just going to have this at my house. And, you know, it's strange um, in this creative, in my creative process, I have so many things that I'm front loading the work with and that I'm thinking about on a conscious level in the beginning that, I'm overlooking some of the most obvious stuff until years later. Um, I grew up um, with my mom who uh, used to make a lot of her clothes and work with a bunch of, a network of women to make her clothes. And she was a fashionista. She was looking at Vogue and all the fashion mags and finding material and going down the street to her home grove and having them make these pants or whatever it is. But I used to go with her all those, to all those trips to get the materials and play around in the bolts of fabric and listen to the conversation and touch and learn about color and combinations and so on. I didn't even tap into that part of this practice until five years into it and say, maybe that's why I'm doing this. My mother was sick at the time and this was really in a weird way, bringing me closer to her. So there's a lot of, you know, sort of personal uh, uh, connections that take a while for me to get to it. That's great, yeah. Um, okay, I'm Okay, uh, if anybody has any more questions, I would, oh, here's, we just got a couple more and I'm trying to read through them. I know some people, I think especially, you know, because of kind of this, this group in particular um, are interested in your fabrication process and whether you 
distance and, you know, kind of about how you're attaching fabric to other fabric and things like that. She could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I wish I had a magical, very uh, methodical way of doing this. Um, a lot of this is highly improvised. So if I'm working at three in the morning, I have no one to help me, then I'll do my really poor provisional sewing and attaching to mechanically connect some of these pieces. Sometimes I use different types of adhesives to do it. Sometimes I rely on the paint to do it. Um, sometimes I do various sort of transparent processes directly onto the quilt to give them a certain amount of body. Um, sometimes I have quilts that are so disheveled and so layered that there's no way for me to work on them. And they literally sit around for years because I'm like, I just don't know what to do with that. And um, I have a show up now in Chelsea that's called Soft Truths that has a few of those type of quilts in there where I was like, you know what? The work is already done there. You know, those layers are already telling the history of how that thing was made. And you could tell that there was, you know, different type of batting and that there was a different layer on top of it and different, uh, different uh, cover quilt on top of that. So it's, it's really improvised. Um, the paints ranged once again from spray paint to acrylic paint, sometimes oil, oil stick, pastels, charcoal, pencil, airbrush, glitter tar, um, dirt, mud, uh, you name it. Um, and I have a few um, uh, staff in my uh, studio that do help with the more professional sewing. Um, these are often hung with Velcro, so they're doing some of the Velcro attaching. They're making solutions, especially when I started working with the three-dimensional quilts. Um, I really had to uh, consult with people who had way higher skill sets working with this material than I did. Um, and there's a couple of questions about um, Japan and Buddhism. Um, one person's asking what took you to Japan and motivated you to live there for three years. Um, and someone else is asking about your artistic practice and your background in meditation and um, how that kind of filters into the making of the work. Um, well, I wound up in Japan when I was um, graduating from undergrad. And uh, during my undergrad school uh, years, I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. And I ended up um, in Florence, Italy for my junior year studying Italian and fine art. And upon graduating, coming back to the US, graduating, I wanted to get back out of the country as soon as possible because it was such an enriching experience. And a friend of mine called me from Tokyo and he'd been living there for around eight months. And I heard the transformation in him as a person. And I was like, you know, I need some of that in my life. And he gave me some suggestions of places to look. And I wound up applying to something that's called the JET program the Japanese exchange and teaching. And so I literally was teaching, team teaching English in Japanese junior high schools and high schools for three years. So the JET program has been around for over 30 or 40 years now. And they, you know, my salary was enough to have an apartment there and to live actually quite well, um, especially then because it was the bubble, Japanese bubble economy. And so that's how I wound up there for three years. I just enjoyed it so much that I stayed. And three years was the maximum you could stay in that program. And the meditation, it started while I was there, but and this is really actually a great question because it ties into code switching. I learned a lot about subtle and unspoken gesture while living in Japan because the way their society works, there's many ways of speaking and showing deference and respect or disrespect without ever uttering a word. It's not cursing and yelling and flicking somebody else. There's just certain subtle things that can happen. And I thought it was fascinating. Um, not only that, seeing how there are different striations in the society, but and the way it operates in contrast to the way things are in the U.S. Once again, um, being a minority in the U.S., you find different ways of communicating to deal with certain situations. And when I was in Japan, I didn't have to do any of that. And it was interesting to find some of my white counterparts that were in that program feeling like they were being treated in a racist way because they couldn't enter any restaurant they wanted. They couldn't go to certain places. They were excluded from so much of society. Whereas I actually was included because I started learning the language and following certain of the unspoken ways of communicating and conducting yourself. So I was allowed access to certain places. And it was an interesting dichotomy to see how they were responding to what they thought of as racism and how I actually never thought about racism there because the one or two small racial Incidents I had there were so minor compared to having a foot on the back of my neck here in the U.S. or having guns put to my head, which I have had happen here in the U.S. by the cops. There's no comparison. So um, what was that about? That wasn't even about meditation. Okay, meditation. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, through all of that, 
I found um, meditation while I was there. And I know that that was a big thing. That was um, a way of people dealing with everything in Japan, basically. Um, and getting deeper and deeper into Buddhism, I started to go to 10 day retreats and you know silent retreats and finding ways to channel energy and try to utilize more than what was it, 12% of my brain like we're supposedly <laughs> charged with using. Okay, um, let's do one more. Does that sound good? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we are on time, honestly, but um, okay, Laura Johnson says, since these are palimpsests for you and are ways to explore the past, present, and future through textiles, do you want the pieces acquired by museums in particular to change over time, deteriorate, flake, et cetera, or would you prefer them to be preserved and kept in as close to an altered state as possible? Um, and do you consult with museums who acquire your pieces about how to interpret them? Yes, um, I've been doing some consulting with some of the pieces. It depends on the institution itself. But as I alluded to earlier today, I mean, this stuff is strong. These materials are strong. They last a long time. Many of these are pre, literally the majority of these are pre-1900 quilts. And some of them are incredible. Uh, none of them look like they're torn and shattered, and, you know, and uh, thread more bearing, none of them. Um, so it's really amazing how much they've already held up. So I assume they will outlive all of us anyway. But um, this actually goes a little bit back into Japan and maybe even to meditation. And there's this sort of um, idea of wabi-sabi where the actual perfection and the profundity of a piece is in its quote unquote imperfections, the rough edges, the torn fragment, the dirt, the smudge, all of that. So I actually like that those elements are in there. I consider that to be part of the artwork. So if they deteriorate to a certain degree, I would like that to be to its process. Um, the only preservation I see necessary is if the thing is at its last, last, last leg and is about to disintegrate, but that's not gonna happen in any of our lifetime. So I'm not really that worried about it. And um, I don't know how long those museums will be around, but um, they'll figure out something back. <laughs> Great, well, um, I think we're gonna end there. Thank you so much, Sanford. This was so wonderful. I'm glad that we could have you also just in the space of your exhibition. It's been just really great to see you you know, speak to individual pieces and get the up close view. Um, and thank you so much to your studio for organizing this and to the Bronx Museum for their help with it too.